All right, so now we're live. Can you check on that? All right. I'm going to take my mask off. Is it on? Oh, hi, everybody. We are posting live at Santa Cruz Corps, and we are um, here with the community, and we're going to be talking with Ryan Coonerty. Hopefully, he'll show up here soon. And we have a bunch of uh, questions that we're going to hopefully be able to answer along with uh, a public adjuster who's going to help us as well. So um, please be patient as this is uh, kind of an impromptu setup. We've got breakfast here, and we've got uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of people. So we are going to get started here in just a moment. All right. I am going to be right back. I'm going to go call Ryan, make sure he's on his way. You're live, Jamie. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, if you are watching this and you are part of the Bonnie Doon community, please put your email and phone number, um, not, uh, you, direct message me, you probably don't want to put it under the live stream, but direct message me your email, phone number, and name, and how many people are in your family, because we're trying to create a um, email list of everybody who lives up there so that we can disseminate the information effectively. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go holler and I'm going to get everyone around, so thank you for being patient. All right, so we're going to kind of gather, we're calling Ryan, he said he was going to be here at 10, I don't think he's here yet, but I have a couple of announcements and we can get started with our, um, the insurance adjuster who's here, so if you want to get a little bit closer, we're live streaming it, which is why we're in the corner. So I'm waving to you on behalf of all the community in the parking lot. So if you haven't put your name and um, email address and phone number on the clipboards, please do that. We're creating a website and we're going to be sending out emails as we understand more. We're going to disseminate the information to you. My name is Jamie. I'm a resident on Empire Grade right below Pine Ridge. Where if you go up Empire Grade and there's a white farm fence, you go down there, that's my property along with two other families. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming. And second of all, I just want to say that I'm right there with you and I'm sorry for your losses and the trauma that you're having to endure. Um, if there's anything that we can do at all, that is what we're here for. Um, I'm a big believer in community. And when I saw what was going on and what wasn't going on, I took it upon myself to organize with some of the other residents to make shit happen. Sorry, pardon the French. But um, that we are doers, and it, that's how we process. Everyone processes differently, and that's completely okay. So don't think that you need to be doing more. If all you can do is sit and cry, that is completely acceptable, okay? So give yourself a hug. Get hugs from as many people as you feel comfortable, and um, know that we really we care about you. We care about the community, and we love you guys. Whether you're able to get up there, we are able to um, deliver to drop areas. There's one in Deer Haven and there's one at Pine, um, on Empire Grade 8595. We call it the airport house. And I just want to let you know that there is, if you know people who are currently still up there, we are delivering fuel. Yesterday we delivered over 200 gallons of fuel to Deer Haven and to Empire Grade. We deliver um, chicken feed. Um, I think it's Lori Megan Smith. I don't know if that's her name. Lori, she has been awesome in helping with the animals. And there's people up there that are doing rounds. And we did rounds yesterday. The community is not, not everyone is super aware of what's going on up there. So we spend our time delivering. And then we also spend our time communicating and like pouring our heart, you know, like listening to them. Um, so there's some people who are in really great spirits and some people who aren't in really great spirits. And I just want to um, let you know that we're all, we are all, all in this together. And again, if you need anything, like, please reach out. We created a community uh, committee um, and we're calling it the Bonnie Dune Fire Relief um, dot org, I think is the website. And so we're asking for people in the neighbor neighborhoods to um, volunteer to be captains to help disseminate information. And so we're organizing right now what the neighborhoods will be. I'm assuming like Pine Ridge, Bonniewood, um, you know, Upper Summit, uh, Martin Road, right? 
so part of Pine Flat and then other parts of Pine Flat. So we're going to ask for two captains per neighborhood if you feel called to do this. Um, we, we would love you to maybe star your name or just um, message me. I have business cards here. Um, this is the hub because this is my local business, my husband, this is Bo and I, we live in Bonnie Dune and we run Santa Cruz course. So we've been dropping stuff off. If you need stuff dropped off up there, you need to write the address on it. We may not be able to go to the address, but what we're gonna do is we'll put it at one of the drop zones closest um, and then we'll be able to uh, get it. To, and then the people there are like helping. So we've got a really amazing community and I just, you know, you guys need to applaud yourself for all the work that you have done. It's just, it's been incredible and I understand there's a lot of loss and I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. And so again, we're going to, we're going to rebuild together. So um, Ryan Coonerty's here and we're going to ask him to come and um, talk and have, if you have any answers, if he has answers to questions. So we just want to like, thank you so much, Ryan, for being here. Um, we have a mic for you. Hold on. Oh yeah, here you go. Uh, hello, everybody, um, and uh, it's it's good to see your faces. I feel like we've been in a 24-hour uh, slice Facebook or uh, converse 24-hour day slice Facebook conversation. Um, look, I don't have a lot to say. I, I know that um, the Bonnie Dune community is incredibly resilient, incredibly tough, incredibly independent. Um, and the work that you all have been doing to protect and uh, preserve and really care for your community has been inspiring. Um, I, I don't think people will ever know uh, how much was done and the million little stories of people helping each other, um, but you all know. And it's from all those little individual acts uh, that we will complete the big acts of rebuilding Bonnie Dune um, and Swanton and Last Chance. Uh, White, Heart, White, White Horse Canyon, White House Canyon. Um, and uh, I'm here to help. Uh, as I've said a million times, um, I'm, just, I'm here to be your partner um, and wanting to help give you the resources you need to do what you know is best for your community. I, it's not going to be um, my vision or the county vi vision for what happens in Monty Dune. It'll be your vision. And my job is to help streamline that process uh, make it easy uh, and try to get you the resources when you need uh, when you need them and where you need them. Um, I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, and be available both in front of the group and if you have private questions that you want to uh, ask, uh, I'm here. I have my cards. Um, I will say just as a note, um, a lot of people are like tagging me all over Facebook and I'm finding my best trying to find it. But if you have questions for yourself for your family for your community if you email me or call me um, I don't I, I feel like I'm missing things because it's just coming in from all angles uh, and so uh, so please feel free to ask yeah can you stand right here wait hold on if you just stand right here because there's we're live streaming it oh. and then if you if you speak loud enough then I can repeat the question okay I know it's early you know but I'm wondering if Santa Cruz is putting out like an official meeting to make sure that uh so uh, just rephrase oh, the question please. so the question is um is santa cruz creating a committee to rebuild if you just want to repeat the question and your answer that's helpful sure um so uh on tuesday bruce mcpherson and i have a letter on uh the board of supervisors agenda um we expect it to pass unanimously but it just directing staff to create a one-stop shop a streamlined permitting center uh cap fees and uh and do a, a number of different things allow people to live in temporary housing on their properties uh once it's cleaned up and um as that gets built up we're going to figure out a best the best way to take uh community input and then it's really been inspiring that in the midst of this emergency you're already seeing conversations about how do we build better? Do we build microgrid systems? How do we create emergency response systems, better coverage, cell coverage, communication systems? Um, and that'll certainly be, I'll, I'll certainly be there to help implement sort of the ideas for ways to make it better going forward. Yeah. Um, so the, the question was about uh, the, debris, the debris process. 
Um, so uh, this is in many ways the most complicated uh, part of the process because uh, you have first the hazardous waste, uh, hazardous cleanup, and then you have the debris removal. Um, in talking to my counterparts around the state, um, there's there's a couple different ways you can go. You can sort of leave it each to each individual homeowner. Um, that is not a great idea because you're all competing not only with each other, but now with all the various fire victims going on around the state. Uh, the second way is to sort of allocate it to the federal government through the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I've been told that is not a great uh, approach. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at, and it's still being determined right now as we're still doing structure evaluation and hazardous materials and infrastructure, um, is, a, is a sort of a, a middle ground approach where it either be the, the state or the county who coordinate a master debris service removal contract, and then homeowners can opt in. They can do it themselves. They don't have to opt in, uh, but they can opt in. And that way, we think that's the fastest uh, and best way to, to deal with that process. Just one follow-up question. Um, how do we get on that list? Um, so, let me answer one sure. part of it. So what we'd like is make sure that you're on that email list so that Ryan has like a few points of contact. Of course, he's definitely able to answer everyone's, but if we can get you on that list, there's a committee, then, okay, great. We'll make sure that you get all the information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you can just write that on the list, if anyone wants to volunteer anything, write it down and we'll reach out to you so that we can see what resources that we have to be able to coordinate. So, uh, oh, yeah. So, absolutely. yeah. So, um, in terms of notification, um, hopefully you've all filled out the forms or started to fill out the forms with FEMA. I know it's difficult if you, if you, for some people, if they haven't been able to access it, but there will be, uh, through that process and then also through my office in the county. We'll be reaching out with uh, information. The short answer is, I, I, on timelines, I don't know. Um, I've asked, and I don't know. Um, I had a bunch of information about timelines on Monday that changed by Tuesday afternoon. Um, so, uh, so it's still it's still a little early and dynamic. Sorry, I wish I knew more. Uh, so the question was sort of uh, concern about people accessing your property uh, without your permission or without your input. Um, the short answer is I have to find out more about what that process looks like. Um, it, we've been in an emergency mode, and now this is uh, we're starting to stand up the different uh, apparatus uh, for that looks like. Um, and I I don't want to give you an answer that's that's not correct. I. I do know that there's there's two levels of cleanup, right? There's one level that's the hazardous uh, cleanup, and the second level of cleanup is debris removal, um, and I and and I have to understand both those better. So uh, the question was for the people who are already up there and they're present. Um, uh, I guess people can do what they want to do on their private property. The one thing I'd be really careful of is I see pictures of people without masks. And every burnt down house is a hazardous waste site. Um, and it's incredibly dangerous in the short and long term for people to be up there as all the chemicals in your house have now burnt into the ground, the plastics, everything else. Um, and so we really want, uh, especially for the hazardous side, the debris removal side is one piece, but for the hazardous side, you really want professionals with professional equipment uh, up there because we don't want people getting sick. Um, and it, uh, so uh, 
I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we have masks obviously for the COVID crisis, but it's really like you need hazmat suits. You need equipment. It's not a, it's not a safe thing to do. And if you have family on the mountain, please encourage them to wear masks because the firefighters aren't wearing masks that I've noticed. And so then the, the residents aren't either. And we're wearing like respirator masks and you can still smell everything. Even though it may look clear, there's a ton of smoke up there. They're like, no, it's like getting normalized. Yeah, so the, the question was about uh, assessing tree safety. Um, yeah, and the firefighters I was touring with this week were saying they expect fires next summer from routes that will still be on fire from this event uh, uh, for over a year. Um, and so the, the short answer is in part, and I know there's a lot of angst and, and desire to get back up there, but part of it is we have to assess essentially almost every tree in the area and I saw probably 25 people from Davy Tree uh, up there, and they're going tree by tree, for, starting along the roadways and the power lines, and then in the neighborhoods. But that's a big part of what has to be done um, and monitored on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Sure. Yes, it is. Um, so uh, the question for folks at home was about the tax uh, assessing and both now and going forward. So if you go to the Santa Cruz County Assessor's website, uh, they have a form you can fill out to have your house uh, reassessed for tax purposes uh, if you've had the destruction. The answer that I've gotten so far, and there's always like, you know, little nuances here and there is that when you rebuild, you will keep your, pre, your Prop 13 basis as long as you stay to the same footprint uh, of your previous house. Yeah, so the report I get is there's uh, numerous CAL FIRE crews that are circulating around searching for spot fires. It's a big part of what they do. Um, uh, it's a big part of where they're dedicating resources now that they have the fire breaks in uh, uh, for Felton and different parts, uh, and UCSE and, and other parts. And so um, that is, uh, that's what they're doing. I do hear um about volunteers spotting these fires and either doing it themselves or calling cal fire uh but it's my understanding that there are numerous crews up there that are uh that are monitoring for spot fires there's also um like a ground crew of like i think they're like pr pr prisoners or whatever we saw them walking around yesterday and i was and i don't know if you know this about the national guard but i heard that they were coming in as well yeah so um so we do have i believe we have two inmate crews who have been yeah. uh called in they're stationed out of the Ben Lomond camp, um, and they and it, they were building fire break, and now I believe they're doing uh, some of this uh, spot fire and preventative fire, and some of the, they're also Cal Fire is also doing a number of back burns um, uh, up there, and then um, yeah, we have we we have the state guard here, 
um, and we requested the National Guard. Uh, and I, to be honest, I don't know um, their status or when they're arriving, but they're going to be for the areas that are going to be um, uh, inaccessible for a while. Right now, just by the way, because I know there's a lot of concern about looting. So on a given night, the sheriff's office has 10 sh sheriff deputies patrolling the unincorporated areas of California of, of Santa Cruz County. So yeah, so yeah, they're up. Um, so normally it's 10 for all of the unincorporated from Live Oak, Soquel, Bonnie Dune, Davenport, um, San Lorenzo Valley. And um, we've been at 100 per shift uh, with mutual aid. Uh, and that number may be coming down a little bit, but, but there's uh, a multiplier uh, uh, impact with, with different law enforcement to prevent looting and access. Yeah. I heard that for repopulation of some of those armed areas that the infrastructure has to be, the bridges, the, the roadways are burning, stuff burning underneath them, undermining the roadways, that utility poles and uh, lines all have to get re um, introduced for power there before they're going uh, I th so the question was uh, about sort of the infrastructure checks that are going to allow people back up. I think for the fire impacted areas, yeah, that's what they're looking at. They're doing road inspections. We got a burned out bridge at uh, Mill Creek on Swanton that has to be replaced. Um, and then, the, yes, they're very worried about uh, the, the stability of the roads. They were doing road inspections all day yesterday. And that'll be ongoing and uh, fire uh, and trees that are falling. The the the, the sheriff's office, sheriff's deputy had a tree fall on his car. The fire chief was up there inspecting, and the uh, a tree fell right behind him. Um, and so they got to do all the trees along all the roadways um, to ensure safety. In terms of responsibility of the utility companies, like. There's very little phone reception in Montana, and so I'm wondering, are they going to be like, I know they've had some rumor that landlines, they want to take, you know, remove landlines in that area. I'm wondering if they're, they're going to be required to maintain the landline access when they restore the utilities up in that, in Bonnie Dune. Uh, yeah, so the question was about communications infrastructure. Ironically, um, I think I'll five days before the fire, we had a Rural Body Dune Association forum on uh, communication, emergency communications infrastructure. Um, the the state is al was allowing them to take out landlines. We were pushing through the Public Utilities Commission uh, to, uh, to not allow that. And then we will be working going forward on trying to increase communications infrastructure because it's, it's just a uh, uh, we saw firsthand how critical it was, um, but it's um, but we the county has no regulatory authority in this area, so we what have to. What we can do as a population to like push that. Yeah, so a lot of you wrote into the Public Utilities Commission and the Consumer Advocate uh, arm of it, uh, that then puts pressure on the Public Utilities Commission. That was enormously helpful. Um, thank you to Andy Davidson for organizing that event and pushing that information out, um, and then. Yes, going forward, we'll need to figure that. We need, we'll need to continue to push, and then also the communications. Um, there will there there needs to be locations on private property in order to facilitate um, the communications infrastructure because the topography of Bonnie Dune is so challenging from a from a coverage point of view. Thanks for uh, everything you gave us. By the way, so I have two quick questions. One on the assessment for the folks that haven't lost.
expand on that. Is there somebody that we can point them to? Or I, I guess I'm looking for who is actually making decisions so that I can at least connect them so that they hear from somebody officially in charge of the county that we're not allowed in. Or, you know, I know that there are resources, but I'd love to have a here's who my insurance person is. Yeah, so um, so the two questions. The first was the question about sort of partial damage. Um, you should fill out the form with the assessor's office. Property tax is determined on a parcel by parcel basis. So to the extent that uh, you were being assessed uh, and that is now damaged, that would reduce your basis uh, for your individual property. In terms of the insurance, uh, yeah, we sent a letter to uh, the insurance commissioner, Lara, yesterday or day before. Things are running together. Um, asking him to actually, uh, first of all, put pressure on insurance companies uh, to pay full claims, to renew insurance following this, uh, and to assign a point person to Santa Cruz County uh, that can um, help you be advocates vis-a-vis -vis your insurance companies, because um, the insurance commissioner obviously has a lot of authority over insurance. Um, so I'll let you know what we hear there. Um, in terms of um, a point person uh, uh, for people saying, look, I got to get in and have this assessed in order to get my benefits or to start my FEMA claim. Um, that's a really good question. I've been asking that. It, the question, the answer has been, let us get things stabilized. And we'll get that to you. But I think that's like, on. I made a to-do list of the many things I was working on. And that was like number one to try to figure out how do we get that point person through the emergency system so that you all can get those answers for your insurance companies. Awesome. Just to follow up on that, I think that's a concern too for uh, cleanup. If, if there are folks, the National Guard or state or whoever going in and doing any kind of removal, if we haven't let adjusters in by the time that happens, I think there's going to be a problem with, you know, they'll say, well, no, it looks clean. <laughs> right. And we're like, oh, no. Yeah. Um, yes. And then uh, to your insurance company's claim, I mean, what I'm hearing from my colleagues around the state have dealt with these fires is yeah it's never a week and a half so um so that's just a blatant lie <laughs> uh, not surprisingly yeah hi um thank you ryan I, I would like to just take a second to appreciate the fact that while we're all grieving the loss of so many homes and so much of what we love about bonnie dune we are incredibly lucky that we're grieving structures right now and not people if, we ha if you haven't yet seen the PBS special on mega fires that was made after the Paradise Fire, I think we all need to watch it. We should have like a community viewing because that is where we're starting. And honestly, if the lightning had struck in different places, we'd be having a whole different conversation right now. And so as we think about rebuilding and as anxious as we all are to get back and as much as we're worried about everything, planning for yesterday is suicide for tomorrow. We've got to start totally rethinking if we want to keep living up there and if we want another generation to live up there and one after that this is a whole new story that we're facing right now so i just would like to just sort of recognize that and so yeah and yeah um i mean um the the one casualty we have and we still have one missing person um um given how uh given that this all happened in the middle of the night uh for many of you were evacuated you know at 11 o'clock at night and different things um it's a te it, one there's a level of luck absolutely two um the the tight knit of the community where i knew that community members were going to their neighbors to make sure that they knew to evacuate um we're extremely lucky we didn't have uh, a lot of people uh lost in this experience and then going forward um yeah resiliency Clearly, as we look at hurricanes hitting the United States and storms and everything else, resiliency will be absolutely essential. Yeah, so the question about permitting process and costs. And uh, so on Tuesday, we're voting on a letter that I, uh, Supervisor McPherson wrote 
uh, to uh, create a one-stop permitting process with dedicated staff. What we've found in other, what I hear for other counties is you may get your planning process going, but you don't, if you don't include environmental health and public works and fire, then people still get bounced around the system. So we're creating a one-stop uh, shop. We're gonna cap uh, fees uh, and, and, uh, <coughs> and reduce fees. Um, and if you really want the model for what we're looking at, the Sonoma rebuilding, if you go to the Sonoma County fire rebuilding website, um, that's essentially what's now, after they went through a lot of painful experience uh, and learned, this is where they ended up. So we're gonna try to start as that, that's gonna be our starting point and really pushing forward. And I was saying uh, to someone this morning that the planning process is one about the rules which, we could, which we're working on to allow temporary structures and rebuilding and all kinds of other things. The second thing is about, and it's incumbent upon my office, about the culture, right? Uh, to have people, uh, uh, to know the expectation is to move quickly and to help people and to start with yes and work backwards and not start with no and try to get to yes. Um, and so that's the conversations that we're already having about uh, ha making sure that, and if we have dedicated staff, we're doing the same thing every day, instead of bouncing back and forth between other projects, we think that'll really help uh, going forward. And so we're trying to look at FEMA funds to hire some dedicated staff. Sure. So the two questions were, were sort of power restoration uh, by by area. The second question was sort of returning by um, uh, how what's the repopulation plan. So the first on the first answer, let me just say uh, PG&E. I haven't been a fan of PG&E. I was trying to form a new power company to take PG&E's power away. Um, so far, they've been really good, and there's a huge number of teams. They're very responsive. They're working hard to figure out how to get power restored. Um, and so I want to appreciate, I'm not always a fan, but I want to appreciate um, their efforts uh, in this regard. The second question was the repopulation. So right now they're looking at it repopulate, repopulating by these fire districts. Uh, and if you go to the fire maps, you see all these sub districts, 006, 009. Um, and that's how they're looking at repopulating right now because that's how they did the evacuation. I, and uh, yeah, and they will get the word out uh, by by each one of those districts. I know some of you are talking to me because uh, some of those districts are quite small and contained and, and it'll be pretty straightforward. Some of those districts, you have areas that have significant damage, you have areas that have no damage. Um, and so um, when I do this and then when I go to the Civic, after that, my next call is to call the folks who are doing repopulation and try to understand how are they going to draw? What are they going to do in districts that have uh, two different status in them? Um, and I, so I don't know the answer to that. We'll parse that on slide two. Yeah. 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 Yes. If I get a, if I get an okay. answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the more granularity or layering that's available, the better I think it will be. Yeah, no, and they're going by the districts. I think um, I'm hopeful that in the next 48 hours, um, Davenport and then the the fire districts that are coastal, coastal right. Bonnie Doom between the city and Davenport uh, will be able to go back, and that's what that's the next, and then the, then we'll start working on the next step you after know that. Anything about Bonnie?
Uh, I think they're looking at the next 24 to 48 hours. Ben Loman and Felton, 24 to 48 hours. No promises, because right. like everyone <laughs> keeps changing, but yes. For um, some of the folks that are still up there, um, like our situation is that we have a generator, but it needs propane. Propane's running out. I can't see. Somebody said that they saw a propane truck up there. Is, is it possible to get a propane Um, I don't, so Ryan is a district supervisor, and so anything that is um, happening on the ground level, best I would, I'm making an assumption that that would be going through other volunteers and not Ryan. Okay. Um, so right now we have gas. If you have like mini propane tanks that you want us to take up there, we can get those and put them up there. But we have not. I was I've been up there every other day, and we've only seen water trucks, not propane trucks. But I can we can certainly ask. I was just saying, who, who to ask? You know. Yeah, it's basically um, the people around you are coordinating. You bring it here, we drive it up. Well, yeah, it's tied into the system. You can't use the system. Yeah. yeah. But we do have people up there who have been, like, wiring wells to generators, which okay. is um, – so there's people who are electricians and robotics experts that are helping, and they're going around and, like, filling people's generators. And then, like, for me, I didn't have a generator on my well pump, and they, like, jerry-rigged it to make it work. Ours is already wired in. So it's just no problem. Okay. Yeah, if we can get another tank and like change it, we could maybe do something. Yeah, um, yeah, I, um, when, uh, touring up there, the immediate thought you have is mudslides. Um, and so, um, so they have teams up there. They have a special watershed team, uh, up there because obviously it's the watershed for all of us all the way to Live Oak. Um, and then, um, and yeah, there's going to have to, I mean, this is, this is, it, this is why, and I know it's frustrating. It takes so long. It's because if you have to check all the roads, all the storm drains, all the trees, all the water, uh, and PG&E um, in an area this large, uh, when we're also competing with resources from around the state, it's a it's a challenging uh, it's a challenging task. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, so, so yes. And the city, the county has been pushing out, uh, updates, particularly on the uh, county Twitter feed, Facebook's feed, and we'll try to get, uh, more push out more information, um, as fast as we can. One last, one yeah. last question. Um, is similar to the having a, Anybody that can be appointed for uh, the banking, so that I think a lot of people are going to run into their lenders. You know, insurance money's run out. We're not even allowed to spend. Lender says your mortgage is due. Is there anybody that could be appointed to kind of work with the bank as well? Because that might be. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so the question was about banking, um, and um, because we've been in emergency mode, I've only heard this secondhand that people run into there's different bridge financing gaps. Uh, and so I've talked to uh, County Bank um, and uh, I'm going to talk to Bay Fed about post-earthquake. They formed a sort of consortium uh, to help do these bridge financing or these sort of local financing, uh, create these local financing mechanisms. 
and they're already making the calls to look at that. Um, we don't have authority over the banking system, so all we can do is convene. Um, but um, but I know that the local banks are already already know that they're going to have to play an important role. I know Wells Fargo is doing that because I was already called and offered uh, some adjustments. Okay. Also yeah, about. And, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> also about the FEMA and SBA, there's a lot of, there's some programs, whether you have your house uh, totally damaged or smoke damaged, we'll, we can address that after Ryan um, leaves. And let me just say, for the people who had small businesses that have been impacted, the SBA loans and the Small Business De Development Center at Cabrillo is like the best small business resource, even if you're not, even if your business hasn't been impacted, um, but they especially know how to work through the SBA process. Uh, and set you up. So reaching out to the Small Business Development Center at Cabrillo is a really good, good, really good idea. And the, yeah, that was the question for those homeless about uh, renewing homeowner insurance. And that was in our letter to Commissioner Lara, who we've already been in contact with because this was an issue before the fire, uh, obviously. Um, and we're going to be looking to his office uh, for the advocacy because he's been able to put in different moratoriums in places, but these renewals uh, gets challenging. Rachel? Uh, so the question was about uh, cell phone coverage in Lower Bonnie Dune. Short answer is I put in, uh, uh, asked a couple days ago, uh, and then I put in a request this morning with both Verizon and AT and T, um, and uh, so they're um, waiting to hear back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so the question was uh, about uh, the Bonnie Dune Fire and Rescue and and making sure there's a good relationship between them and Cal Fire uh, and a recognition of the value that both play. And um, I, I think that's a uh, primary lesson that's been learned, um, hopefully. And yeah, I'm committed to trying to make sure everybody's uh, working and collaborating and integrated.
Uh, yeah, so I think uh, once things stabilize a bit, let's get together with Cal Fire and uh, look at um, what our, uh, what the options are in that area. So the question was just about um, the fuel load that's still up there and that we're just approaching fire season, and that was Ryan's response. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions for, for Ryan? Sure. So, uh, so the question was um, for folks who have uh, re water resources um, that they'd like to replenish or get back online. Who do you contact? So there's two two pieces to it. One piece is uh, for day passes. You call the dispatch number uh, and you can put a request in. And depending on the the need uh, and the safety of the area, etc. Um, the sheriff's office can approve that. The second thing is, if you send me an email uh, with outlining uh, the property and, and the resource and all that, I can at least get it to Cal Fire and see if they can respond. Yeah, yeah. and you can also let me know, and we have people on the mountain that might be able to just do it for you. I'm a, okay. And I'm going to leave uh, a bunch of my cards here in case uh, people want to contact me. Oh, sorry. So that quite the question there was uh, being able to get up there to replace uh, essentially water resources uh, for Cal Fire. Um, how to how to how to make that contact? And I said that there's essentially two ways. One way is uh, if you call the dispatch center for the sheriff's office uh, and put in your request for why you need to go up there, depending on the safety, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, they can approve it or not approve it. The second part is if you have something that you want to get to Cal Fire, like uh, availability of more water, if, if, if this fix can be made, um, I can at least, if you email me, I can at least forward it to Cal Fire. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, if, uh, so if you uh, if you come to if you write to my office, I can send it on to the government relations person at PG&E and try to figure out the status. So, um, uh, so that question was about ongoing resources. So I just, just because I think it's important to be transparent, right? We're, we've slashed the budget this year because of COVID and next year. And as all your a bunch of properties come off the tax rolls, the county budget's going to get worse. Uh, so there's going to be diminishing resources for even basic services. Uh, so we may have to look at other increased assessments or other ways to get resources because there's just not, I mean, we, you know, we're still in a COVID pandemic. We're still losing tax revenue. Um, and this is going to put enormous strain on the county budget in an almost unimaginable way. So 
maybe the answer to this is like we don't need the government to like do the job. We just need to be allowed to do it. Like how do we formalize these like renegade fire brigades that we've all been part of? And how do we get some kind of a relationship with Cal Fire? It's like an extension of the Cal Fire Department. We can fund this. We can do this. No one cares about our property and our land and our community but us. So like, yeah. how do we formalize? So I think um, that's a really good question, and that goes to the point of trying to figure out what those relationships are. Uh, so the question and, was, sorry. how do we formalize the relationship between the Bonnie Dune volunteer people like myself and you and all the people who've been going up there and helping to fight the spot fires and Cal Fire? Because up at the mountain, there is no um, disagreement. They're actually very grateful for each other. Yes, we would strictly bond us with more and more fire, with climate change. This is just the new reality. Like, someone made a point about do we want to live there? We do want to live there. Yeah, um, so I think that's a conversation uh, that we have to have about, how, you know, where it can integrate, where it can't. I will say, I mean, just because I've been caught between the two, right? Cal Fire is looking at this from 40 million people and thousands of communities. And how do we, what's the liability look like if if there are a thousand communities that do this? And how, what's their training and who... Right. Yeah. No, and I think, and I, and I think that's exactly right. And hopefully those stories um, trickle up. And then I don't know whether we need state legislation or other things in order to, 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 to better formalize or just allow these kinds of relationships. Well, we just need a voice for now. And we yeah. Definitely look into you for that. And we appreciate it. Yeah. Andy. Right. And that's the, that's the, yeah. And I think that's what I was talking. I agree. The conversation you used to have, and then that's one of the conversations of like, do we need to lower the requirements uh, that the state puts in place? And what,
Okay, that is not true because I've seen them take it from my fire from my well. I can say that my house, I had a firestorm break out, and they would not scrap off a forty-five thousand gallon hydrant that was right in front of the house. It absolutely is was not the case, and I and I saw that happen with my house in peril with an unbelievable firestorm, and we ended up taking a, another a, another pump, but in general. What I saw was not a lot of like preference of getting water tenders to go to pressurized hydrants in town or in the quarry than to take it from uh, local local hydrants. We have 200,000 gallons of water in our in our neighborhood, and there was very little water taking or trucks hooking up. There was no water tenders, so there was about a half an hour after hell. Um, I saw up at Cave Gulch a couple of water tenders coming up the hill across from where you live, on Bonnie But there was no, there's not a lot of, I, that's a question I have after, is we have these requirements for putting in all these water water supplies. Why is it that the trucks, and it. understanding the answer to that question is still a big mystery to me. Of why, why is it that they don't want to take the water from the hydrant that's right there? Because it's, 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 um, it's part of our, it's part of the code, right, for building your houses. And another thing I would like to add, it's kind of a minor thing, but uh, my wife and I are uh, trying to fix one thing, the water spout. Part of the code is putting in plastic uh, hoses. And what I heard from Cal Fire, what I saw with my own eyes, is these things are like six inches from your house. Because they burn. We have flames coming up out of the rain gutter orange drains going eight feet into the air and while we were uh, cutting out one of these hoses um, you know we put our lives in you know it's like even crazy and so that's another thing I think that needs to be looked down the road down the road is like some of these requirements that might not be used or actually more danger than uh, they are so yeah um, and I have to go to the civic to talk to people but uh, but maybe one more question yeah well, I was here for the market Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can we get the mic off him? Oh. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna now transition. We have a um, we have a public adjuster here who's gonna answer questions about insurance, and also if you have any questions about um, FEMA. Or the SBA, I can answer some of those. I'm not. I I've done it myself. If you have insurance, you have homeowners insurance. They still recommend that you apply for FEMA because it may be able to bridge the gap between what your insurance has and what um, is covered. I mean, I feel kind of bad. I have a provider, and it's going to be enormous smoke damage. I was thinking that I don't want to take FEMA funds from all you folks who lost everything. So the question is, she doesn't want to um, take FEMA funds from people who've lost their homes when she has smoke damage. All right. So what I would say to that is apply, and the people on the phone will help you to determine the amount of money that... I mean, if you're up there, and your fridge is there, and it hasn't been emptied, which it now is growing mold, it's toxic, you can't open it, you're going to need a new fridge, you know, bottom line. So there's things that maybe your insurance will cover, and they'll be able to determine that, and they'll do the research and then grant you money or or not. So if you want, one of the people told me yesterday is that if you want funds granted to you, you have to apply for the loan to be considered for the grant. The, the loans are anywhere from 1.9 to like 2.5%. You can take it and you can give the money right back or you can at least apply and then get the grant money. So don't, don't not do the loan because you may not be able to get the grant money. 
We've seen people so far who have gotten money from just being evacuated in Scotts Valley, and they've gotten some grant money to help pay for their hotels. So apply. And if you need help applying, I'm helping people. Apply for the loan first. So you you apply to FEMA, and then they will call you, and then they'll give you the, the then there'll be a next step for the loan process. And if you have like for me, I have an Airbnb business, and so you can also apply. They'll refer you to the SBA. As COVID already did an SBA idle loan, an EIDL loan, and there's another SBA loan for for you for a uh, fire disaster. It's on the website, and the the interest rate is actually less than the COVID loan. It's like at two and a half percent instead of three point seven five. And these are loans that are long term loans, and they go up to two million dollars for um for businesses. Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, so the, the money will come from FEMA wired directly to the bank account if you get a grant from FEMA. The SBA also, if you apply for a loan through the SBA.gov and there's like disaster relief loans for businesses, it will come directly from them. And you, it's a 10 minute application. I've done hundreds of them if you need help. And if you've already signed up for help and I've missed the call, it's because I'm in Bonnie Dune and I will get back to you. So please don't be upset with me. Um, you do it online. It takes about 10 minutes. Yeah, I do it online. Yeah, so I believe it's just you can Google FEMA and then you'll see the information there. Yeah. Also, there's um, food being delivered, like fruit and stuff being delivered into the annex if anybody wants to take any. Thank you. All right. So here we're going to let um, Steve, Steve. Steve talk. He's a public adjuster. I'm Steve Severate from Greenspan Adjusters International. And just here to... I've done it with my just here to answer any questions you guys might have. We're better off getting uh, our own private adjuster or just accepting what the insurance company does? Well, uh, the only studies that have been done were done out of Florida and demonstrated that the collection rate was substantially higher when getting a private adjuster than uh, going with the insurance company. Big up to everybody out there can hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, and, and the same question. So the question was, are we better off getting a private adjuster or working with our insurance company and taking what they give us? And the only, the only official studies that have been done were done in the state of Florida, and they found an enormous difference in the collection rate for people that hired their own adjuster versus the people who did not. Uh, the, only, the only time when it's, there isn't a value to bring in your own uh, group of people to represent you to balance the scales is if you have such incredibly low insurance that there's just nothing more to do. Because one thing that we can't do is we can't change what the limits are of insurance are. But a lot of people miss the extensions of coverage, the extended replacement cost, the replacement cost versus the actual cash value collection. So there, there's a lot of nuance inside that policy. Okay. Related to that, we have two weeks temporary housing for our insurance. And I'm reading from FEMA, it can go up to 24 months. Yeah, that, that's a really big question that everybody seems to want to know is, uh, so the question was, there's only two weeks of coverage uh, for civil authority, and then how do you go from, if you're over two weeks, how do you still collect beyond that? That's the question. So if you have physical damage of your home, and physical damage can mean uh, heavy smoke, it can mean the well burned down, it can mean anything on your property that creates physical damage, that generally will open your claim up to be on the 14 days of coverage and give you your loss of use coverage that's in your beyond, policy. Beyond yes. So we just can't get up there to take a look. How will my first work? Well, that's the problem right now because uh, the insurance companies are saying, well, we need proof that there's physical damage. And so it's, yeah. Please. Would the power restoration be considered part of that? Because now we can't. Pardon? Power itself, uh, the question was, is, is not having power enough to create an extension of two weeks? And the answer is no. Uh, power isn't one of the things. You have to have physical damage to your home. But physical ha damage doesn't mean your home has to burn down. If you have a heavy layer of soot through your home, that all has to be properly dealt with. And then sometimes it's not as just wiping down. It's hiring a company to come in, getting rid of insulation. And then sometimes you've got to pull drywall out, and then you lose cabinetry. So. Even if you only have smoke damage in your home, there's a high likelihood that it's going to take real time to get back and get it restored properly. Your soft goods, could, your mattresses and things could be affected where they have to be thrown out. So 
even if you didn't lose your home, it doesn't mean you don't have a real insurance claim that you need to pay attention to. And if you do have that real insurance claim, it opens up that loss beyond two weeks. If we lose power, most of us are going to lose water as well because the water pumps. So is that, is that considered loss of use as well? Or? No. No, it's got to be physical damage at the property. Displacement is not yeah, enough. Smoke. Displacement's not enough. Now, if you had a, we have one client up here who their water tank actually burned, their whole, their system burned. That's physical damage, even if they didn't have anything beyond that. Please. Um, for those who are homeowners that may have renters, how do you go about applying for homeowners insurance and renters insurance? How do they kind of correlate? Is it better to one or the other? Is it at the same time? So the question is, if you have homeowners who also have renters, what's the best way to insure that? Are you talking about a home that you live in as a homeowner and then you bring in people who rent rooms from you? Yeah, or just being the owner of that house on a big piece of property, say you have two houses and one pays rent and that person has renter's insurance, that house is now gone. Do you have to pay the So the further question is if we have a property with more than one home on the property, one home is owned by the homeowner, another home is rented, should we schedule those together or should we separately insure them? Generally not. If your properties are all listed on the homeowner's policy, there is a clause in the homeowner's policy that gives you coverage for an area of the home or a home that is held for rental. So you're covered under the homeowner's policy for rentals. If it's just a property that's just a rental property, you're better off buying a, a landlord's policy. So I had a situation where I would live in the house that they have a rental on my property. My renter had already been evicted because they were not paying the rent. So I had to She would want to file her own claim with her own renter's insurance policy, and you'd want to file your own claim with your homeowner's insurance. One will not hinder the other. No. I have a question. So, with how how can how can you um, assess for the damage to the smoke and everything if you can't get up there? Yeah, that's that's the difficult thing right now is access to determine how much damage you really have, and it's kind of a wait till we can get a. a ability to get up the hill to see. So then how can we get our um, additional living expenses covered? Well, uh, I would recommend that everybody who's got an outbuilding that burned or anything that's you're so close to buildings that have burned, there's going to be a lot of smoke damage to all of those homes. So if, you're, if a neighbor if a neighbor 200 yards from you burned and, the, and it came within 10 feet of your house, do you have smoke damage? Yeah, you're going to have smoke damage. The question is to what degree. Right. So if it's a light amount of smoke and it didn't get in the house and so you pull up and everything's fine, then you don't have physical damage. But if you can't walk in the house without choking? If you can't walk in the house without choking and there's a layer of soot on things, that is physical damage. And there are some policies that try to restrict coverage for smoke claims. But the state of California, because of all the fires that have happened, they have legislated that those restrictions don't apply in California. So the insurance companies will sometimes say, well, we're not covering that smoke damage and we've got a limitation in our policy. But in California, they have to cover those claims. They can't limit the collection of those claims, uh, according to some of the latest legislation. Thank you. Please. Yeah, so one thing you might want to ask your insurance company that you'd like to have a hygienist come out to do to take samples and do testing. If they won't do it, I'd recommend that you hire somebody to take those samples and do the testing because insurance companies don't like smoke claims. Uh, they're not a big fan of paying a lot of money towards smoke claims. So you really have to demonstrate and prove your loss. And the first step is to get somebody in there that can do testing and determine the level of smoke that you have in the home. So would you just Google like smoke hygienist? Generally, so I can't tell you what some rogue fire guy might do, but generally they don't go onto your property unless there's an active fire or trees burning. 
They don't go on your property and start clearing things out because you do want all that evidence there when you bring your insurance company up for the first time to be able to show them everything that's happened to your property. And generally that stuff stays in, in that state for you to be able to get up there and gain access and share with your insurance people. Yeah, that gets really tricky. Um, the trees are, are covered under your policy, but whether that creates physical damage to your property that you couldn't live in it, not really. So I'm not telling you that I wouldn't try to make the argument, but that's not a, a clear example of, of uh, being in, uninhabitable. And what I was told is that it's not, um, they're insuring that the, the house, they're not insuring the property, but you could argue if there's erosion dam, there's possible erosion problems, you could talk about that kind of thing. Yeah, but if you if you can still go to your house and live in your house, even if there's no power or water or water, they're going to consider that your home is is livable and that you're not going to go beyond the two weeks. Well, that comes into that two weeks of coverage for civil authority, and and then unfortunately there's just that very limited coverage if you don't have if you get back to the house and you can live in the house that that's where you get limited to that two weeks. What I did with my insurance company is I said there's damage. Yeah, that, that would I can't be my. Get up there, there's damage. Yeah. That would absolutely be what they, I'd say. I have damage. Yeah, and then they jump from the two week claim adjuster to a damage adjuster. Okay. So, to what extent are people like yourself, adjusters, your advocate versus uh, the advocate for the insurance company? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what's the question? The question is are, are, are the adjusters that we're getting appointed to. Are they advocates for the insurance company or they are advocates? The question is, are the people who are being sent out by your insurance companies advocates for the insurance companies or advocates for the homeowners? The answer to that is that they represent the insurance companies, they're paid by the insurance companies, and they have no fiduciary duty to you as a homeowner to make sure that you ask and get everything you're entitled to. So how do you go about picking an adjuster that can advocate for you? How does that work? How do you choose a public adjuster? Right. Uh, references are critically important. Being licensed is critically important. Being a member of our National Association of Public Insurance Adjusters is very important. Uh, and and those are, and making sure that they have the breadth and the ability to handle your claim that they're not taking by, taking off more than they can chew. And are you a public adjuster? I'm a public adjuster with Greenspan Adjusters International. So can you speak? Can you speak a little bit about? Go ahead. So, what is your recommendation for people? Who have considerable damage in one? Uh, can you expedite things? What, what's the level of advocacy that you would do? Yeah. So when you hire a, a reputable public adjuster, they can get involved with the insurance company. We have multiple claims with the different insurance companies, so we have more contact getting in there and advocating. We also know what our clients are entitled to. So where people have never been through this are trying to figure out: Well, is it okay if I do this, or is this is this too much, or? They don't know what they are allowed to get, and we have a good benchmark of what is normal, what's usual and customary, and what they paid. So that helps our clients in getting uh, back and knowing what they can do with housing and that kind of stuff. And also, we bring out inventory specialists to help determine everything that was lost in the home. We bring out structural people to recreate, in theory, what it would take to build that house back, even if you're going to build an entirely different home. And we have people who help with that housing. So, so having that advocacy is is not just having advice, but it's having somebody who's actually your mouthpiece with the insurance company, speaking to the insurance company, pushing for payments, and pushing the claims process along uh, to, to get you to a good so result. So they're not able to take advantage of your inexperience as much. So they're not able to take advantage of your inexperience. So what is, what is your cost as far as being, hiring a public adjuster, and would you, would you represent people who have that smoke damage and not just a total, like, like for myself, I have a, an outbuilding and then smoke damage. Would you consider um, repping somebody like that or is it just for total loss? Most of what we're doing is for total losses. We are doing some partial losses for a variety of reasons, depending on the degree of damage and, and you know, a lot of other factors. But most of what we're doing is total losses. And but I'm happy to talk to anybody, even if they have smoke. It's not always about hiring us. It's about getting education, getting information. On some of the smaller claims, you'll be okay without having a professional on your team and and some coaching sometimes is what you need and we're happy to do that what's the what, how what are your fees how do you pick your fees uh, public adjusters work on a contingency fee uh, it's generally on the building and the contents 
I wouldn't hire a public adjuster who also wants to charge you for your loss of use or ex uh, additional living expense because that's really money you need to live somewhere. We don't charge for that uh, unless there's a unique circumstance. Uh, and, the, and the typical public adjuster's percentage fee is 10% of the claims. So that's 10% of the building, the contents, and the extensions. Please go ahead. So, so the question was, if you know your limits and you know you're going to need that to rebuild, what can a public adjuster do for you to still help you? Is it the personal property? And I'll tell you that uh, oftentimes to get to those extended coverage on the building, even though you know you're going to spend all the money, getting the insurance company to pay you all that money is not always just as simple uh, as just them writing you a check. Some of the insurance companies are coming out writing policy limits checks for the stated limit. Some are not. Uh, but even with the stated limit, there's generally an extension of coverage beyond that that you could be entitled to. And you really have to prove and demonstrate to your insurer in order to get all of that money. And then on the personal property, yes, a good public adjuster will make a huge impact on what you collect on your personal property claim on the detail, the level of detail, the pricing, developing a custom depreciation schedule for your family so that you get paid the highest amount of money in cash and not necessarily have to demonstrate showing receipts for everything you replace. Because a lot of people don't replace everything. So building that personal property claim up to really be detailed, include everything, current prices and, and tax and all these things and limiting the depreciation makes a gigantic impact on what ultimately ends up in insured's pockets. Please. The question is, do we have to wait for an adjuster to show up before we can clean up or are pictures good enough? Pictures are great. Videos are great. There's nothing like seeing it in person. And if you can get your adjuster out there early, especially if you have a, a partial loss of smoke damage, you, you wanna, you're want you probably better off bringing professional people in to do cleaning so that it demonstrates you had physical damage. And it's better if you can have the adjuster see it with his own eyes and agree that you have physical damage that then opens up that policy period for you. So do you get the adjuster first or do you get the hygienist up there first for smoke damage? The adjuster and the hygienist. Okay. And then the first meeting with the adjuster is to agree to have a hygienist come out. Okay. Please. Do adjusters work with the California Fair Plan since Yeah, adjusters still, public adjusters can still represent you with California Fair Plan. And oftentimes you have people have California Fair Plan have a wrap that covers additional uh, stuff beyond the fair plan policy also. So then you're working with two insurance companies, fair plan and state farm or whoever the wrap is with. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Adjuster before the hygienist? Yeah. Generally, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your help and explaining things. You're if very you, welcome. If you guys have any other questions or concerns, please, um, uh, I put his information on the um, Facebook Live. We're going to be posting this to the Bonnie Dune Relief, uh, Bonnie Dune Fire Relief .org, um, website, and then I have business cards here if you need to connect with me or get anything up on the hill. Thank you for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And, yeah, I want to talk to you more. Okay. Um, so I, so my neighborhood, I have um, 10 acres and 90% of it burned. I have a, like a shed that burned. It had gear in it and bikes and stuff. And then my house, like we, we opened the garage yesterday and we couldn't even walk in it. So, I mean, my house was um, slate, roof and stucco siding. So it's, so it's safe, but the, like, I mean, we have like a $20,000 bed in our bedroom and we're not going to sleep in it. And I'm allergic to, I'm allergic to dust. I cannot, I can't even breathe. Mm -hmm. So how do I get like compensated for the damage? I told, I called and I said, I don't know what's going on yet. And then I said, no, it's damaged. So then they moved me to another adjuster. And I haven't talked that to was a smart thing to do, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to say I have a heavy, heavy uh, smoke in my building. Yeah. And my soft goods all have to be totaled out. Yeah. So your soft goods are your beds, your couches, your upholstered furniture. Wait, say what I'm, tell me what I'm going to say again. You say heavy, heavy smoke damage throughout my home and all my soft goods need to be totaled out. I have heavy smoke damage throughout my home.